We're gonna be in Leviticus chapter 23 this morning. So Leviticus, third book of the Bible, toward the beginning. It's not one that gets read often. And so we're gonna dive into that today because I think it's really, really important. Just a couple of verses, Leviticus 23, 23 to 25. So let me set sort of the stage, sort of frame the background before we read this so you kind of understand what you're parachuting into. So we are starting a series today called uh, 10 Days of Repentance. Now let me explain what's going on behind that. Two things. One, in the Old Testament, God sets in motion in the book of Leviticus and also in Numbers seven holidays or seven festivals that the people of God, the people of Israel are supposed to observe annually and rhythmically in a very specific ways. Each one of them is a different picture with a different prophetic fulfillment. So already I've said a mouthful. There are four spring feasts. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Shavuot, which we know as uh, Pentecost. They each have a prophetic fulfillment. On Passover, Christ was crucified. On unleavened bread, he was put in the tomb. On first fruits, he was raised from the dead. On Shavuot or Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given. So you see those four prophetic fulfillments. There are also three spring feast, and this is what we're going to focus on uh, today and next week. There is Rosh Hashanah, or the Festival of Trumpets, which has just been celebrated September 18, 19, in a 24-hour period here in uh, 2020 among Jewish people. There's uh, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, which will be celebrated uh, 10 days from Rosh Hashanah. And there is Sukkot, or the Festival of Tabernacles. Each of them also have a prophetic fulfillment. They just have not been fulfilled as of yet. We are gonna focus on the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah, or the Festival of Trumpets, and Yom Kippur. Because those 10 days, are de- they're called 10 days of awe, and they're focused on repentance. Now, why this? Why now? One, it's seasonal, and I think it's any time we can connect with the rhythms of the Old Testament in a gospel-centered way, uh, it's a good thing. But secondly, in the midst of all of this pandemic, how many of you would just say 2020 has been different than you expected? I mean, all of us, if you were to Google, like, what is the most common, you know, sermon series in January of 2020, what you're going to find is that tons of churches all over the place preached messages like 2020 Clarity or Vision 2020, this is going to be our year kind of thing, but nobody was expecting what has been 2020. And to me, I think actually we have gained some clarity looking back. I've constantly asked myself, like, Lord, what are you saying to your people and to your church in a time like this? Uh, Because it's unique, right? You don't always have a global pandemic. You don't always have sort of the the cataclysmic issues of our our day that are going on, both in, in things we can't control and things we can control. It's just a really unique time. And I believe the Lord uses times like that to speak to his people. And one of the things that has been clear to me over and over, both personally, but for the church of Jesus Christ, is that we need to repent. I think Jesus is saying to us in this moment, I want my church back. I want my church back. And what does that, what does that, what does that even mean? He doesn't really want crowds. He's looking for disciples. And we kind of know that, but we've sort of walked away from what is true discipleship. And I think he's calling us back into a right relationship with him. The only thing that we can do about that is repent. (laughs) He does the work, but we do the the repenting. So I want to explain that. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Luke, I mean, Leviticus chapter 23. We're going to read verse 23 to 25. At the end of the main text, we just say this phrase, the very words to distinguish God's word from my uh, own. 
and then we'll jump into these 10 days of repentance. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. You can be seated. Now, that's a a short description of the Festival of Trumpets. It's what God commanded. First day of the seventh month, it gives us timing. It tells us you got to bring a food offering. Uh, But many, many very specific things happen. The point of of, of Rosh Hashanah is this, this is a picture. This whole thing is a picture. So this is the head of the year, the beginning of the new year. If you were waiting for 2020 to to, uh, be over, just get on the Jewish calendar because it reset, uh, yes, two days ago. Um, With the entrance of a new year, according to the scripture, two things are going to happen. Uh, with the sound of a trumpet or the sound of a shofar. So we're not talking about silver trumpets here. We're not, we're not talking about a brassy sound. We're talking about a ram's horn. And for those of you that are uh, maybe like to dig deep in God's word, this comes from the, the narrative, the historical narrative of Abraham and Isaac. When Abraham was asked by God to sacrifice his son, his only son, the one he loves, Isaac, to sacrifice him, what is, on what is now Mount Moriah or the Temple Mount, and instead of sacrificing him, God provided a ram. And that ram's horn, that blowing of the shofar, it, it, it originates there. All right, so if I've just confused you, sorry. For those of you that are geeky like me, go, go, go look it up. It's... It's fascinating. But that shofar follows us into Numbers and Leviticus and right here to the Festival of Trumpets. It's not the only time the shofar is blown, but specifically the shofar is blown here for two reasons at the Festival of Trumpets. The first reason is the coronation of the king. The coronation of the king. So, so when trumpets were being, shofars were being blown in Jerusalem some 24 to 36 hours ago or in Israel, it was not in honor of the prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. It was for the sovereign king of the universe. It, it was for what they would say, it would literally translate the master of the universe. This is their covenant God. And so rhythmically at the beginning of the new year at Rosh Hashanah or the Festival of Trumpets, trumpets would be blown to coronate again the sovereign king. Now that wasn't for God, although God commands it. It's not for him to be reminded that he's the sovereign king of the universe. This is for all the people to align themselves with the fact that God is the sovereign king of the universe. It's very kinesthetic. It's, it, you hear it, you feel it, you celebrate it, you sing it all at, at, at the festival of trumpets. Now, side note, Jesus taught us to pray this way. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. The beginning of the Lord's Prayer is also reminding us who's king, who the king is, who the kingdom belongs to. So it humbles us just to remember the sovereign king of the universe. But here's the second thing it calls us to. It calls us to collectively repent, collective repentance. So there is, uh, uh, when you listen to the sound of the shofar at, at Rosh Hashanah, there's these beautiful sounds, but it ends with a, a short and terse uh, kind of three staccata blows. And it is a call, that, that sound is the call to repentance. So we've coronated the king, and now let's remember how we have offended the king this year. And between that the blowing of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, these 10 days, every day, everyone is entering into a time of personal and national repentance. That's going on today in Israel. And they, they prepare in three ways. And we can learn from our Jewish friends here because we don't typically in the West, we don't have a, t- a depth of understanding when it comes to repentance. Here's what we think repentance is. 
Uh, God, forgive me for saying that cuss word. And then the next day when we say that cuss word, God, forgive me when, we, when I say that cuss word. I'm just picking on, on that, right? But you pick any sin, right? It's just this is like constant sort of flippant almost. Like just, just forgive me. And then we kind of keep, keep walking in it. This is a, this is a, a deeper understanding of repentance. So there are three things that they do in these days of awe, uh, three ways they prepare to completely repent. The first is this, this is Hebrew word tefila, which means turning to God in prayer. So every day, everyone is going to get alone with God in prayer for a time of self-examination and confession. Self-examination and, and confession. This means I'm going to ask the Lord, the sovereign king of the universe, reveal to me the ways that I have sinned against uh, you. They are going to do what is called teshuva, which is a turning uh, away from sin and toward God and others, particularly others we've harmed or offended. So here, here we go beyond the typical understanding of repentance. Normally we would just say like, I asked God to forgive me and he forgave me, so I'm fine. But here the understanding is I'm gonna also go to the people that my sin has hurt in these 10 days, and I'm gonna ask them to forgive me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna confess that. I'm gonna ask them to forgive me. This is the tishuva. And then three, the zedekah, which is uh, turning to those in need. So the understanding that often we walk through life uh, saying we're people of the sovereign king of the universe, but we pass the poor or the oppressed or the people that are in spiritual, physical, or emotional need. We just walk on by for whatever reason. And here we're repenting of that. We're reconnecting with that. The, the, the heart of the sovereign king of the universe all through the scriptures from beginning to the end is, from the poor, is for the poor, for the oppressed, for the least of these, for people that are hurting and wounded and in need, right? And so we're gonna repent of, of passing by that. This is how we, repent, we prepare for these 10 days of awe. Now, and, and repentance, Romans 2, 4, Paul said this to, uh, to the church at Rome, and I think it fits us. Speaking of repentance, he says, or do you pres presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? To understand that God's good kindness to us, his steadfast love is a grace meant to lead us to repentance. And repentance is one of the greatest gifts God can give us. The ability to turn away from our sin and back toward the sovereign king of the universe whom we have offended. Now, there are four aspects of repentance. I want you to get this in your head because this is what we're hoping for as a church. We're hoping that all of us, whether you're watching online today or whether you're here in the room, all of us would take seriously the next 10 days that we would schedule in our busy schedules, we would schedule a time with God where we get alone and we truly go through a process of repentance every day for 10 days, 10 days. Now, what is that gonna look like? Well, I sent you an email this week. If you haven't picked it up or if you delete the ones that come from Bay Area, go look and you're in your trash. Sometimes they have important things in there. And so uh, it, it, th these four aspects that I'm getting ready to share with you, this is how you will process through repentance each day. Uh, we'll be putting it out on social media each day. We'll put it back in your inbox each day. Uh, join our pastors and ministry staff on Facebook Live each day for the next 10 days for 10 minutes or so focused on an aspect of this repentance. Okay, so you need to find a quiet place alone, and then you're going to go through these four aspects of repentance. So let's talk about these. Um, one, we're going to forsake the sin. Forsake the sin. So, so this means a couple of things. It means that I have to acknowledge not only that I'm a sinner generally, but that I need to um, pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal specific sins specific sins that I harbor in my heart that I sin against God or other people with. So often, so often we conceal our sin. 
we hide it. We, we sort of push it under the rug or we clean ourselves up a little bit and, and, and try to say, you know, I mean, I'm a sinner. We'll admit that. But we don't deal with the specific nature of sin. And here, in this kind of repentance, we forsake the sin, meaning we make a list. Open your journal, get your app on your phone, whatever, and make a list of the things that you know that are sins that, are, that, that, that grieve the heart of God, that may hurt other people, your, your spouse, your kids, the people, your coworkers, other people that you're, you, you relate to, and we forsake the sin. So that in prayer is gonna look like uh, going to God and confessing. It's interesting, the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, who, uh, you know, if you look at his life, he's a huge sinner, just like the rest of us. He wrote this in Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. So what we know and that all of scripture teaches is when we, when we humble ourselves and we forsake our specific sin before God, it moves the heart of God. And we find mercy, but so often we skip the forsaking of our sin, and we should, because it grieves the heart of God. So we list these things, and we confess them to God. Here's the second thing. Secondly, in this time of repentance, we need to regret the breach and relationship with God. Now, here's the deal. Western Christians think like this a lot. Jesus died on a cross to save me from my sins. I'm gonna sin. I'm not perfect. I'm gonna do bad things. I'm gonna go to heaven when I die because his grace is sufficient. And that's true. Nothing, the the Romans tells us, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Uh, His blood is sufficient to justify you on the day of judgment before God. That's the work of Christ. He did that. But as we're walking through life, do you know we're going through this process called sanctification? It's this idea that we walk with God every day of our life. And do you know that our sin actually causes chasm in our personal relationship with God? Uh, if you're married, you know that you, if, you, if you get in a fight with your spouse and you're unrelenting and unrepenting, you know that it can cause a chasm in your relationship even though your spouse might still love you. It's a feeble illustration, but it's sort of, sort of similar for us to understand the tension is that God is not moving away from you when you sin. You're and I, we're moving away from God. We're choosing our own way. That's what sin is. And so we have to regret that breach. We have to go before God like David did and regret the fact that we chose our way over his his way, Uh, our best plan over his best plan. David wrote in Psalm 51, Verse three and four, and you should read all of Psalm 51 uh, when you get a chance. But verse three and four says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Let me just ask you, how many of you know your sin? You're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. We know that much according to the scripture. Uh, It's true that when you can get people to be honest, they know what their sins are. They know, we know what our sins are. And so David is saying the same thing. I know, I know my transgression, my sin is ever before me. Against you, meaning God, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. David recognizes that his sin causes a relationship breach. It causes him to be farther from God. You, he, at least I hear people say things like this all the time. Like, uh, you know, I did this. I can't even, I, I haven't prayed in months because I, I don't think I can even go before God. Or I'm, I don't want to read, I, I, I want, I know I should read my Bible, but I don't want to because I, I feel like uh, I, I'm not I, I'm worthy to hear what God would have to say. Or I didn't come to church because I've just been doing this thing and, and I feel like I can't be in church and and be doing this thing, whatever this thing is in their life, right? It, 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 that you recognize the tension and the breach. Let me just say, if you sin like crazy, you should still come to church. If you sin like crazy, you should still read your Bible because Jesus is gonna speak to you. If you sin like crazy, you should, you should humble yourself and, and pray. 
But it's that sin that causes this chasm, right, that we, we move away. And so we have to regret that breach. And sometimes we don't know what it's like to lament uh, that kind of relationship breach with God. We don't fall on our faces and say, oh, God, forgive me for I have sinned and sinned against you alone. Oftentimes we just say, God, forgive me in passing, and then we embrace that particular sin against, uh, again uh, and 24, 24 hours uh, later. So this is important that we regret the breach. Third thing, we confess the truth and we make amends for lack of a better term. Matthew chapter 5, 23 to 24, it says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Now, this is an idea and understanding that uh, our sin affects other people and that we have a responsibility in the repentance process to confess the, the truth about our sin to God, but also to other people. So much so that Matthew is telling us here, hey, leave your, leave your, altar, leave your, your offering at the altar and go make sure you've got your, your relationship right with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Then come back and offer your gift. Often, our sin harms other people. And the lie we buy is this is not hurting anyone but me. This is not hurting anyone but me. And the truth of the matter is all sin affects all of us. See, we're all connected. We're in a community connected by Christ. In a family, in a marriage, you're connected in even deeper ways. We harm each other with our sin. Um, and we must repent of that. And part of true repentance is seeking forgiveness from those we've sinned against and doing everything we can to make amends. So, I mean, maybe this is, this is I need to have a conversation with somebody. Maybe this is somebody that's far away that, you know, it's, it's going to be hard for you to have face-to-face. One thing pandemic has taught us, Zoom, Google Meets. We can all do that. Maybe you need to write a letter. Maybe you're better at writing what you're experiencing. Maybe you need to write a letter and send it to somebody that that you have sinned against. But the point is that in our repentance, we confess the truth to God and we seek his forgiveness and we confess the truth to other people that we've harmed and we seek their forgiveness. You know, true repentance, it's evidenced in this, if I repent of my sin today, a specific sin, and 24 hours go by, and I'm tempted to sin exactly the same way in similar circumstances. You've had those rhythms in your life, right? You repented of a sin, a little bit of time went by, and now you're tempted the same way. Well, true repentance is not just, I said the words, Father, forgive me, not just I said the words to somebody else, forgive me, but is the resolute behavior change, the resolute action that would say when I'm tempted in just the same way again, I have done this thing called turning away from my sin and toward God. And in that moment, if I've truly repented, I'm gonna choose God over the sin. That's how you know if you've repented deeply and truthfully. Rhythmic sin You haven't really repented. So you repent. It doesn't mean you'll never sin again, but this word tishuva, this shuv means turn. This tishuva is turn toward God, turning away from the sin. Uh, The most miserable people I know are Christians that know they're supposed to be free from sin, but are walking through life every day and just a ton of sin. And really it's because they haven't forsaken the sin, regretted the the breach, made a, uh, sought forgiveness from God and other, other people in the process of repentance. They just said some words, God, forgive me, and kept, kept walking. This is a deep repentance. Now, here's the fourth aspect of this repentance, and it, it sounds easier than it is. It's accept your forgiveness. Accept your forgiveness. So a lot, of times, a lot of times people will feel so much shame and so much guilt over sin that they have a difficult time accepting what is the good grace of God. 
The scripture tells us very clearly in 1 John 1, 9 and many other places, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now we began this by saying we were coronating a king, the, the, the sovereign king of the universe and entering into a time of repentance. Now get this in your mind for just a minute. You're talking about showing up before the sovereign king of the universe who created everything, who is holy and perfect, and you're sinful and you're confessing these sins to him. And the scripture teaches us that he's gonna pour out mercy. He's gonna pour out grace, that his steadfast love lasts forever, that you might be the prodigal son or daughter, but he's gonna be the father waiting for you to return, killing what is called the fattened calf, throwing a great party, putting a new ring on your finger, robe on, on you to signify you're his kid, new shoes on your feet. That's the kind of grace and mercy he offers. He forgives when we repent every time. That's his steadfast love. That is the beautiful gift of God. But this repentance allows us to walk with him so closely, to experience this grace, this mercy and love. But we need to accept it. And just sometimes we have a difficult time. We'll say things like, you know, God could never forgive me. I I don't know how many times I've, I've heard that. Like the people like sort of level sins, right? Like I, I, I knew he could forgive me for cussing, but all this pornography, I don't think he can forgive me for, right? They have levels of, of sin. And, and the reality is for all sin that is repented of, there's mercy and grace and hope that he does that work. And that is, a, that is the great gift of God. This is the gospel uh, and, and in its entirety is that Jesus died on a cross to save us from our sin. He paid the penalty of that sin. And when we repent, our, our first greatest act of repentance is that first time you humble yourself believing that Jesus' blood on the cross is enough to forgive you of, of your sins. There's no other way according to the scripture. But this rhythmic repentance that takes place all the time in our life, you know, for the Jewish people, this is a big deal. It's a 40-day period, but these 10 days of awe are a really big deal. But do you know, as a follower of Jesus, this should be a part of your day, every day, repentance, tissue vow. We are the repenting people. (laughs) We're the ones that know, like, I can't save myself. Oh, God, forgive me. Repent and turn back to him over and over again. Be quick to repent, but accept your, uh, accept your forgiveness when you have repented. Um, this is important, and it is the gospel. And, and oftentimes I'll tell people, like, in my office, just me, them, and nobody else, it's like, you say you believe God for heaven. If he can do that, He can write your relationship with him right now, no matter how bad the sin is. It might be hard. Remember, we got to deal with the other. A lot of people just want to say, you know, I'm right with God. I don't have to deal with other people. That's not what the Bible teaches. We do have to deal with other people. It can be difficult. And they're not like God. They may or may not forgive. But we have to do our part. God always does his part. So you accept your forgiveness. So these are the four aspects. You're gonna go through this daily for the next 10 days. You're gonna get before God in prayer, forsake the sin. You're gonna regret regret how that sin has caused a breach in your relationship with him uh, practically now. You're gonna confess the truth and turn back to him and confess the, the truth of your sin to other people who you may have hurt. And then you're gonna accept the forgiveness of God daily for 10 days. Why is this so important? Look, a couple of things. God is doing something in the world today that's different than, than, and it has our attention. I don't know all of what God's doing in the world today. I don't know every bit of his purposes. I don't know all the answers to why, but I do know he's refining the church. He's saying to the church, repent, repent. Repent. And we want to do our part in that collectively. The the church is we, not just me. 
not just you, but it's we. So I'm personally repenting, but when we do this collectively, these 10 days, we are coming before God, not in a blip of asking for forgiveness, but in daily, deep repentance, saying, you're the sovereign king of the universe, and I am not, and I'm aligning my heart with yours, and forgive me and make me clean, and we will be different people on the other side of this. Why would Jesus say, I want my church back? He would say that because the church has walked away from Jesus. We know about Jesus. We consume Jesus when it's uh, convenient and comfortable. But we have a lot of other idols. We have a lot of other idols. We have a lot of things we need to repent of. And this is that moment. I don't know a lot, but I know this. This is that moment for the church and for our church specifically. So I want you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. We're gonna go into a time of really calling us into repentance. And so I just simply want you to spend some time with the Lord, just a few minutes, being quiet, asking him to speak to you. if you will, commit to God in prayer to make time to be with him every day for the next 10 days that you might repent and find his forgiveness. Right now, we just uh, can't repent of everything in just these moments. But we know we need to walk this out with you over the next 10 days. And so, God, we commit as a church, each, each one of us, each part of the body, we commit to find time, to make time to pray, to forsake the sin, to lament, to regret the breach. Father, to confess the truth and seek forgiveness from you and and others, and then to receive your forgiveness. God, make us new people in this. We love you. We trust you. This is hard, but we trust you. Speak to us. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see truth about ourselves and you in Jesus' name.